Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin, and I have with me Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems, OpenMPI, and also uh, HW Loc, which happens to be our topic today. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're kind of cheating on this one, aren't we? <laughs> yes, a, a little bit. We're interviewing uh, one of the other developers from HW Loc, even though I'm one of the developers too. But uh, if anybody looks at the subversion commit log, you'll see that this guy has written a whole lot more of the HW Loc code than I have. As a matter of fact, I... I believe it was part of his thesis work and whatnot. I've been doing, you know, ancillary build system, configure system, and he's been working on the heart of it. So he, he can speak much, much more intelligently about this stuff than, than I can. So we're cheating, but only sort of. <laughs> well, before we uh, introduce our guests, we have a website, uh, rce-cast.com. Uh, there you can nominate new shows, pick up old ones, subscribe to iTunes. There's an RSS feed. So please stop by there and pick up any back shows. Uh, of also, course, I gotta, yep. I gotta throw in the plug for my own blog, the MPI Bcast blog out there. That uh, it's on blogs.cisco.com, and there's a link off the RCE Cast. And I try to get about one entry a week out there, and I try to say something at least nominally interesting. Last week, I talked about traffic, and my my ac- my favorite acronym that I'm trying to get people to use: NUNA, non-uniform network architecture, because it's all about the networks these days. There's networks inside the servers, right? So it makes it more complicated. It's good stuff. Nuna. Start using it in casual conversations. Well, actually, the uh, software package we're talking about today, HWLOC, is for kind of understanding the topology inside of a server, I believe. So let's go yeah. ahead and introduce our guest, and he can give us a better idea. We have uh, Samuel Thibault, um, who's yeah. from France. So, Samuel, how about you uh, introduce yourself, say where you work, and how you got started on HWLOC? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a researcher in Bordeaux um, between the university and the INRIA Institute. Um, I'm working mostly on uh, runtime support for mach- parallel machines, and um, so be it multi-core or accelerator-based. So that's why I was interested in, in, uh, in topologies and uh, locality in machines. Um, on a side note, I'm also a Debian developer focused on the accessibility topics, in particular for blind people. So I, I feel compelled at this point to say that the, the, the standard disclaimer that we're ugly Americans and we're horrible at pronouncing uh, other people, other language names and so on. So Samuel, can you pronounce your name as, as you say it? Because I, I'm quite sure that we're not saying it properly. In, in French, we say Samuel. With a U, which is difficult to say in English, indeed. Okay, we'll, we'll try, but I but I can't promise. No problem. <laughs> so, Samuel, can you go ahead and give us a rundown of what HW Loc is? We just mentioned um, Nuna and networks, and just give us a ten thousand foot view of what HW Loc is and what it does. Sure. So. Um... It's actually a set of tools to detect how HPC components relate with each other. So how um, pro- processors share cache or memory, uh, network boards, etc. Things like this, and then tools to bind uh, HPC applications accordingly. Uh, so it doesn't provide the intelligent part of the mapping, etc. Just the portability of the tools to actually discover and pin things around. Uh, although we we do provide some examples. Uh, for, for people to get inspired from. So actually, let me extend that definition just a little bit. I, I think this is actually more wildly uh, applicable than just HPC. I think there's uh, quite a lot of applications in enterprise and elsewhere that, you know, as we're going to more and more cores in a system, they actually care about this stuff. And so I, I think this is not just an HPC uh, kind of thing. I think this is where it's going to, we're going to, cut our chops and, and make our name, but uh, I think it's going to be wildly uh, wildly popular after that. Just my opinion, though. Yeah, I mean, Modern Machines now, you're looking at 48 cores and like a regular 2U server, so it's getting kind of crazy. So, Samuel, can you give us a uh, where the name for HWLOC came from? I guess this is an interesting story. 
Well, it's actually a very long story. The thing is, uh, you, uh, at the start, uh, during my PhD, I was thinking about um, lip topology simply. Uh, the thing is, there was another lip topology that existed uh, afterwards, so we had to change the name, and we had a lot of discussions. Uh, you can find on the list and on the uh, wiki the various names we, we invented, uh, some very difficult to remember, some very difficult to Google, and eventually we thought that just hardware locality um, abbreviated into uh, HWLock does Google quite fine and well, it's good enough for wh what we needed. So why exactly, I guess Jeff you could probably answer this question too because you've wrote a number of blog posts about this, why is hardware locality and process affinity important in modern systems? So mostly f f from our part, we, we believe the, uh, the important thing is portability of performance. The, uh, for instance, HPC libraries like to bind threads to get them, uh, better performance, but uh, they need a portable way to do this because it's not standardized. Um, so HWLock does provide it. Uh, more than that, um, you need to be aware of the uh, architecture of the machine because if you consider it as a flat set of CPUs, uh, then you would get congestions on the links between um, processors. So it's better to split and distribute the uh, application according to the uh, underlying machine. So be it for um, communication, communication between processors or spin lock strategies, uh, talking with network boards and uh, things like this. Huh? So I'll give another disclaimer here. I think I'm going to go back and forth between uh, being interviewer and interviewee. <laughs> um, so I, everything that Samuel just said, let me add a, just a little bit more on that, is that with these uh, you know, more and more cores in a machine, what is easy to forget is that there's actually a network inside that machine. And uh, you know, if you're not careful... Uh, you know, most people don't think too much, you know, when they're, when they're writing in a, an enterprise class application, they just write their application. They don't care. And it gets some baseline performance. And if they need to, they optimize it a bit to get to the performance to where it needs. But with these larger and larger machines, it might be pretty easy to shoot yourself in the foot performance wise because you're not careful and you don't realize that there's actually communication going on just in writing a, a normal serial or even a multi-threaded app. And that communication could get pretty intensive and you could be really uh, hurting yourself or hurting the overall per machine performance if you're not aware of the locality of your processing and the locality of your data. And so, uh, you know, HWLOC is really all about making the topology of the machine available to the programmer so that they can make some intelligent decisions about, you know, how are they going to run um, and how are they going to, you know, organize their data locality. It's just like real estate. It's location, location, location. Yes. So does HWLOC just give you information about the topology, or does it actually give you the functionality to do affinity? Well, it does both. The thing is, it separates the um, the two notions so that applications can just sit uh, between the two uh, and decide according to what they need. The problem is that you cannot really uh, build a tool that, say, distributes your application of a machine because it doesn't know how the application is structured. Uh, so that's why hardware locality provides the structure information, lets the application do whatever um, in, uh, interesting um, heuristic uh, for, for the, uh, b between the application structure and the machine, and then use the tools provided by HWLock to actually enforce uh, some binding or some, some strategies for communications. So what kind of information about the topology does it give you? Is it just the number of cores and which cores share a socket, or does it give you more information than that? Well, the, um, the basic information that uh, I wanted to put into it uh, when I first designed it was um, to provide the tree of objects in, in the machine. So basically, the, the base structure for it is a tree of objects be it new nodes, sockets, caches, things like this. And then there are some attributes, uh, for instance, the cache size or memory size. 
and then from that structure you can for instance enumerate uh, the uh, number of sockets or know which cache is shared between two uh, processing units uh, and things like that so the idea was to have um, a very simple structure that people can use the way they prefer so how is this information uh, delivered you know if i'm a i'm a, a programmer or i'm a system administrator or something you know how do i how do I use the HW log tools? What's available? Um, you have several ways to, to access it, actually. Um, either you can um, just use the tree, so you start from the root, which is the whole system, and then you go down to find out there are some Numa nodes, and then inside Numa nodes you have sockets, and inside, etc. Or you can um, browse it by level. Uh, say you you look at uh, first the system, then you see that there are there is a set of Numa nodes. So you know there are four of them, and then you see sockets. So you see that there are sixteen of them uh, in total, and you do not consider necessarily the inclusion between Numa nodes and socket. Uh, or you can uh, directly access to some level. For instance, uh, a lot of applications may just want to know uh, which processor is included in which um, Numa node, so they access directly to the uh, Numa node level and then see from there which processors are available. All right, so you're talking about data structures. So this is a, a C API, right? Yes, so it's basically structures with pointers pointing at each other and an array of uh, arrays uh, to, to get access to uh, particular levels of the same kinds of objects. But if I'm, a, I'm not a programmer, um, I'm say I'm a system administrator, I'm a scripting kind of guy, there's, uh, there's probably some tools available for that too, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, the um, uh, hardware locality was usually uh, meant to be a library, but it's also quite useful for us. For instance, when we buy a machine, uh, we want to, to know the, the structure of the machine. So we have a, a tool that um, provides the uh, structure in a graphical uh, way. Um, uh, we also have tools to, to get a textual output, so you, you can mix that uh, into scripts and get the um, uh, CPU masks and to then uh, apply them to, to, to some processes or use CPU sets, etc. Et so we have both aspects, um, the library for applications and also tools for administrators or things like this. Yeah, let me give a, l a little anecdote. I was actually on a, a support call this morning with uh, one of my customers. Um, I, I can't tell you who the customer was, but they're a very large disc maker, and their name rhymes with Schmet app. Um, and uh, I, uh, we, we were doing some things on some Cisco servers, and they wanted to verify some processor settings. And I said, well, hey, you know, there's this great tool called HWLoc. And I said, oh, what's HWLoc? And so we downloaded it right there and built it. took about 30 seconds. And we ran it, and they, I have to tell you, their, their reaction was just almost comical to me. They said, holy criminy, this is great. We need to get this installed on all of our machines. And they were just going off. They're like, wow, you can get it in XML too? Holy criminy, we can script this up. They were just thrilled with it, and it was, it was just fabulous to see that kind of reaction. I can think of some applications. Uh, VASP is the one that comes to mind. It's a Fortran code, but normally it's easy to make a wrapper around C where when you compile it, you need to tell it, a preprocessor, how big your cache is for their FFT routine, and then it's a static thing. Could they just use HWLoc to kind of ask, hey, how big is the cache on the thing I'm running on? Yeah, sure. The, um, what you can do is just um, ask uh, uh, HWLoc um, uh, the, uh, the structure of the topology, but then you can browse it and see the various cache levels uh, from the L1, L2, L3, and whatever cache the levels there might be in the future. And you get the size and how many processors are sharing it, uh, which can be important where, when you actually run some, some computation there. So a little bit of uh, clarification. The affinity ability to use HWLoc to kind of pin, say, executable things on a Linux system, is it working with processes or with threads because they can be different? 
Well, uh, on Linux, we support both, actually. The, um, there are some operating systems where we do not support all kinds of bindings, but on Linux, we do uh, either um, bind uh, threads individually, or we can just bind all the threads uh, of a process, uh, be it the uh, current process or another process. So, you said other operating systems. What operating systems does HWLook support? Well, actually, quite a lot, um, yeah, as many as possible, <laughs> probably. The, um, currently, we support uh, Linux, Solaris, uh, Windows, AIX, and Darwin, FreeBSD, OSF, that is True64, um, HP, UX, and Kerrygood. So we're basically missing IREX support. Uh, well, just because we don't have an account, maybe some somebody listening to, to us <laughs> would have an account for us. Uh, the thing is... Our code is quite independent from the architecture itself, uh, be it x86 or uh, Itanium, doesn't really matter. Um, except in the x86 case, we have uh, some code uh, for operating systems that don't provide enough information. In that case, uh, in the x86 case, um, we can uh, request the information from the processor itself. So that's actually pretty impressive because the affinity stuff varies per operating system. Not every operating system uses it a, a standard way of uh, specifying affinity. Actually, the um, the idea of uh, the library didn't came uh, immediately. The uh, during my PhD, which was about mapping trees of threads uh, on the, the tree of the uh, machine. Uh, made me write on that topology discover uh, thing. So that was between uh, 2005, 2006. Uh, I wrote the um, portability code there uh, because I needed to, to run that on other systems. And uh, of course, quickly I, I found out that it would be um, a good idea to make uh, a library. So I added it to uh, my to-do file, uh, make a lib topology. And that happened only three years later <laughs> uh, when people from my team uh, put some demand on this uh, for MPI, MPI process mapping. Um, so we did it eventually uh, during uh, 2009, and then it became a hardware locality. So what, what kind of entities can um, HWLOC uh, d detect. So we've mentioned a couple already. You know, NUMA nodes and caches and things. Well, what what is the what is the full list of things that it can report in its tree? So the um, the full list would be um, NUMA groups, then NUMA nodes, uh, sockets, caches, um, cores, and the th the single threads within the, the cores. Um, for now, we only handle um, the objects that matter for uh, for processing units. That is, objects that contain uh, processing units. Um, in the future, we, we want to add um, uh, network boards and uh, accelerators and uh, things like this, uh, which will be other kinds of um, objects, and as well as the PCI uh, buses and uh, and switches etc so this is a, a phenomenal step forward there was a, there was a prior project that i was involved in called plpa portable linux processor affinity and and hw loc is is just way better than plpa in in so many regards number one plpa was linux only and plpa only understood sockets and cores and hw loc surpasses both of those in in, in so many ways and so uh we're very definitely deprecating PLPA in, in favor of HW Loke simply because it's it's just better in every single respect. And as a matter of fact, I'm actually right in the middle of integrating HW Loke into OpenMPI, and uh, that is actually the the current holdup in in getting HW Loke 1.0 out the door. Because those, as I'm integrating it, I run across a little thing and I go fix something in HW Loke and so on. And so I think uh, the only thing that's between uh, HW Loke 1.0 RC3 and uh, is is the fact that I've got one little thing that I need to fix that I discovered in, in uh, integrating with OpenMPI last night. So we're getting towards it. We're getting there. So how well does HW Loke understand brand new equipment when it hits the machine room floor? You guys haven't even seen it yet as HW Loke developers. Will it pretty well understand new equipment or? Do you, does HWLOC itself need to be updated? 
while actually we, we had quite a few good surprises the, um, the thing is mostly the problem is the operating system support if the um, operating system layer that expresses things in the machine uh, is already quite uh, orthogonal and things like this, uh, it works quite well. For instance, um, the uh, Magnico um, processor from AMD actually integrates the new nodes inside the socket. So any interface that assumes that a socket uh, is inside a new node uh, would be broken. Um, Linux doesn't do this, and actually somebody on the list reported that he ran a HWDog there, and it just worked fine without any modifications. The um, well, that's for new kinds of arrangement uh, of objects. Of course, if a new kind of object is introduced in the market, uh, we would need to add it to uh, hardware locality. Uh, however, in some cases, I'm thinking about AIX. Uh, um, the, uh, it provides uh, the, um, an interface to express objects in a very generic way, so right at the operating system layer. And uh, hardware locality, when it encounters these unknown kinds of objects, just uh, takes it and uh, expresses it as miscellaneous. And so you actually have the object, you don't know what it is, but it at least provides you the um, structure information. Yeah, there's there's no iPhone or Android app for uh, HWLoc yet, but you know, maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Jeff, a question for you. Uh, as a, I know you work on HWLoc, but you also spend most of your time working on OpenMPI. So, I'm curious, how are you using, and how, how as a user of OpenMPI, will I see HWLoc in work? Ah, so that's the beauty of it. You won't, uh, as a user of of MPI. You're just gonna. So, we actually. Already in, in OpenMPI, we sport a, a couple of uh, command line parameters to MPI run, like bind to core, bind to socket, and, and things like that. And you won't notice the difference of, of our upgrade from PLPA to HWLoc. But what you will be able to see is uh, this will enable us to support hyperthreads. Um, because with the Nehalem series, some of the higher end Nehalem chips, hyperthreading is now, you know, somewhat interesting to HPC. But before, Everybody just turned off hyperthreading because it was completely useless. And now eh, the picture is a little more gray. There are actually some HPC apps that benefit from hyperthreading. And so uh, OpenMPI's MPI run will probably grow, you know, a bind to hardware thread kind of command line option. And HWLoc will allow us to, to support that. Um, internally, uh, we're going to use it for, for two purposes, exactly what Samuel already talked about. Number one, you know, the process binding. And number two... Um, also, just looking at the topology of the machine, so when we do our shared memory communications kinds of things, we'll be able to be a little more uh, intelligent about it. Like, oh, this guy's local to that guy. They share a cache. You know, we can do some stuff with that. Or this guy's just completely remote from that guy, and, you know, we have to, do, we have to be a little more careful in, in talking to him. Oh, so, wait a minute. Let me step back there. You, you can tell the difference between a real core and a virtual hyper-threaded core now with these with this library? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, that's actually, actually really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you want to know, if you want just cores, then you uh, request uh, HWLoc for the core level, and then you know how many there are and their CPU mass. And when you have hyper threading enabled, you see in the CPU mass that there are two CPUs for that. On the contrary, if you want to um, address uh, threads, uh, hyper threads, then you will just request the uh, processing unit level, and then you will really get the uh, threads uh, if they exist, or cores if there is no threads. I have to say, this is one of the things that actually was very exciting to the customer I was talking to this morning, was the ability to distinguish between hyperthreads and cores. And uh, it, was, it was a difficult thing before, and now they have a tool that can just spit out some XML, and they can parse it and put it in their scripts, and they were, they were thrilled with that. Yeah, sometimes you know, you're not really able to, to know whether you have enabled hyperthreading or not just from the BIOS settings of what the operating system reports. It's quite useful for that. 
Yeah, this, this particular customer was looking at, they, they have hundreds and hundreds of machines. And in some cases they want hyper-threading on, and in some cases they want it off. And they were not excited at all about going and manually tweaking all the BIOSes of all the machines to turn them off. And so they're like, wow, we can use HWLOC and just take you know, the second hardware thread offline. Uh, in Linux, and therefore I can script it up into you know an init.d script or however they they want to do it. So the next thing I need is is I need I need to actually have this embedded in a resource manager. I need to be able to tell PBS I want one m node with eight physical cores. I want one node with uh, with all the hyperthreaded cores also, and the resource manager somehow tell that to whatever MPI library or OpenMP library I'm using it so it does the right thing. And that would actually be a really killer integration. All right, I'll take this one because this has actually been a, a lot of my contribution to HWLOC is the ability to embed it in, in other software. And like I said, I'm working on embedding it into OpenMPI right now. So we tried to make the library itself very friendly to you know dumping this into other software projects. So whether you just link to it you know, because HWLOC is installed on your system or you actually have a small reference copy of HWLOC inside your software itself, which sometimes that is useful to do. Um, I'm, I'm, that is actually you know, the, the, the bulk of my contribution so far to HWLOC. But to answer your question, yes, that is very definitely a target. We want, want applications out there like resource managers to use HWLOC. We want Slurm and Torque and all the rest to do it. And I know that Slurm is actually fairly excited about using HWLOC, number one, because they use PLPATA today, and they want to be able to upgrade HWLOC and be able to see things like hardware threads and whatnot. But they're also very much looking forward to being able to detect NICs and other PCI devices and accelerators and things like that. They just pinged me the other day asking when that would be ready and so on. So I, I think there are some real-world HPC applications that will be using HWLOC behind the scenes in, in the near future. Um, I know that the uh, the mpitch crew is also they've embedded a pre-release version of HWLOC in their in their code so far as well. Um, and to those lines too, since I'm Mr. Corporate Suit here, I have to mention that we very specifically made the license of HWLOC be BSD, so it's friendly, and you know we want people to to use this as as much as possible with uh, no corporate lawyer fear or anything like that. Yes, that's exactly the um, the choice we had made for the PAC. So, so let's talk about actual performance gains from using something like HWLOC. Do you guys have any examples of a case where when we started using Affinity with that application, we saw a significant performance improvement in an HPC application? Yeah, sure. Well, the... Um... It depends a lot on the application, of course. The thing is, merely binding threads on the uh, on the processing units sometimes can already give you uh, ten or thirty percent performance. Uh, the um, uh, thing is, if you bind erroneously because you assume some processor numbering, uh, you might get really, really wrong just because the uh, numbering is uh, quite often uh, interleaved and so you actually put your threads uh, on separate sockets all the times. And so sometimes if you just use hardware locality to know the proper numbering of uh, CPUs, you can get 50 or 10, 10 times better. That, that depends of course on the applications. The um, what I could notice during my PhD, um, I mean, starting from a random binding to um, hierarchical, hierarchical binding according to the structure of both the application and the hardware, I could get something like a thirty percent or hundred percent better performance. On um, some cases, it's actually uh, two times or five times better than NPTL, and just because we, we, we do know the structure of the application. The um, Brees uh, tried this morning um, a data broadcast inside the machine, and uh, using the uh, uh, topology information, he could get 25% uh, better um, uh, on, on a 4 NUMA 4 core machine. And we had some measurements uh, for network uh, bandwidth. Uh, we get uh, twice uh, bandwidth uh, just thanks to getting the threads uh, near to the um, uh, network in, uh, card. 
Yeah, just an editorial note on this. It's it's remember now it's it's Nuna, right? There are networks inside the machine and there are networks outside of the machine. So you really yeah. do have a non-uniform network architecture when you're dealing with say an HPC cluster. And you know, we've seen optimizations for years where people are saying, well, if I do a broadcast that's aware of the network topology, I can, you know, cut down the traffic through the core and you know, you get better performance that way. The same exact issues are true now inside the server. And you yeah. need to be aware of the topology inside the server in order to be able to optimize that. And I think that's exactly what Samuel was referring to. Indeed, actually, that, that's the um, uh, the brief work uh, on uh, what we call NUIOR, which is the non-uniform uh, input-output uh, architecture. So the uh, in the um, communications within the machine and between the external network and the insides of the machine as well. So there you go. This is spawning a whole new class of NU prefixed acronym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So HW Loc um, 1.0 um, release candidate is out right now. What is significant about 1.0 versus the previous releases? Well, the, the thing is, I, I don't think there is anything really fancy in it. Uh, mostly it's um, a clean uh, revamp of the uh, the whole thing, uh, be it the API that has changed quite a bit, and the output of the tools, uh, a few details like uh, not using the word, the, the, the abbreviation PROC, because it would need processor, but what is a processor? Is it a socket or a processing unit? So we use just processing unit. Um, we revamped the documentation, documentation a bit, um, so there is also some new things like the uh, FreeBSD and the x86 support. Uh, I also added the um, notion of online and allowed uh, processes so that you can show them in, um, in, in uh, management tools. One new thing is uh, getting the current uh, CPU binding. The issue is that uh, far from all operating system provide it, but well, at least Linux does provide it, so it, it's useful. And of course, there is all the um, embedding work from um, from Jeff, which doesn't really provide features, but which uh, helps uh, a huge lot for integrations in uh, existing projects. Yeah, and, and I, I do want to stress one point here: is the documentation. There is a nice glossy PDF that you can download and it, it tells you everything about HW Loc. This is very, I mean, documentation can always be improved, right? But the fact that there's a, a, a nice PDF that, that details, you know, the, the, the rational, the strategy, the overview of HW Loc, and then shows you every single public function and constant and, and things like that that's there. So it's a programmer guide, it's a man page guide, it's everything all in one nice PDF. I think that's actually tremendously important and will help a lot of people start, you know, from ground zero with HW Loc. And I think what, what Samuel was saying, I have to completely agree with. It's HW Loc provides some of the same features that, that prior projects like PLPA have, you know, socket and core determination. But it provides so many more features and in such a better wrapped up package. There, there's so many more things that you can do in a nice way that we kind of expect people will want to use it to get that information that it's just a fundamentally better package than anything that has come before. And, you know, I say that with absolutely no bias whatsoever. Um, but it's, it, it provides uh, all this information in convenient ways that we think will be genuinely useful to a, a wide class of, of applications. And so that's what we think the value of 1.0 is. It's, it's nicely tied up. There's great documentation and a really nice set of features surrounding that information that you want and need to get. So what's coming after 1.0? Well, the, uh, there is one thing that uh, we've been uh, pushing uh, apart from now is memory binding. The thing is for uh, CPU binding, uh, the uh, interface is quite simple. You just set a CPU bind on a thread. Uh, for memory binding, you have to know whether you want to migrate some existing memory, allocate, how should the functions look like, etc. So we just push that apart to get uh, 1.0 out as soon as possible and then do this later. So we expect to, to, to do this for 1.1. 1 .1. 
we think we should provide as well the um, humor distance between human nodes uh, since it will be useful for most uh, um, heuristics. Um, there is also a feature which is dynamic CPU sets. Uh, for now, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number of processors uh, inside the CPU set is fixed to 4,000. Uh, this worked on um, having that dynamic, so it's already ready but needs some testing, so we push that for 1.1. Uh, what is expected as well is the PCI topology uh, to, to know where um, network NIC is. Uh, with, it is already quite ready. We have a, a branch uh, that exists that w does work. Maybe it would be in uh, 1.1. Uh, I don't know yet. The Brice um, the, the, worked on a lot on this, so uh, he would be better at telling about it. The uh, I'd also like to, to push later, maybe not for 1.1, uh, the topology of the new nodes and the topology of the network uh, around the machine. That is, uh, the output of the of uh, hardware locality wouldn't only be limited to the local machine, but also the other machines are on the, uh, for instance, the cluster uh, to express the um, the uh, connections between the machines, the switches, uh, hierarchy of switches, uh, things like this. Of course, that would require uh, external information from tools that we don't really uh, maintain. So that would probably be through some plugins, and also there is a crazy ID that would be uh, uh, to detect the uh, USB trees and all the uh, devices. <laughs> cool stuff. I'm sure we will have some fine Cisco-based plugins for reading things out of Cisco switches and whatnot as well. Just had to throw that in there. <laughs> um, but as uh, one thing we didn't really touch on is the fact that HWLOC is now a, an official sub-project of the OpenMPI project. It, it really has nothing to do with MPI, but OpenMPI actually is kind of an umbrella for a couple of projects. OpenMPI itself, the software package, is probably the most well-known, but there are a couple of smaller things, and HWLOC, we think, is actually going to become just as well-known as, as OpenMPI, and it really has nothing to do with MPI. It's a nice little standalone utility in itself. But... <laughs> This is kind of a tongue-in-cheek question. Brock is asking me here on IM, saying, uh, well, you normally ask uh, all these open source projects what they use for, for uh, source code control, and uh, do you want to ask yourself these questions? So <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that uh, we use Subversion as our main tree, um, but I do almost all of my work in Mercurial, and I know that Brees does Git. Uh, Samuel, actually, what do you use? Well, actually, for uh, HW New York, I, I just use uh, SVN, actually. But uh, for other projects, I just use anything that <laughs> the project uses. <laughs> cool. Okay, so is there a website, mailing list? I mean, where do you get uh, information for support and getting involved with HWLOC? What, Jeff? Yeah, well, it's, it's the OpenMPI website. So if you, if you go to openmpi.org or com, or net, you know, we have all those domains. Uh, if you go to that, on the left-hand side, there's a little navigation for sub-projects, and the first project in the list is Hardware Locality. And uh, you go there, it has our mailing lists, links to the, you know, download the PDFs and the HTML versions of the documentation and latest tarball, tarballs and everything. And just like anything else, we love to see other people get involved, particularly to support architectures and platforms that uh, we don't natively have access to. So, you know, reports from the wild are are greatly appreciated. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Samuel and Jeff, and we will announce this on the HW Log list when this show comes out. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your time, Samuel. Thanks.